So I've been looking for an SX64 for quite a while. I've never actually owned one of these, but when I was eight or nine years old, I used to drool over these in the local computer store. It's been on my donation wish list for many years, and I've had a few offers that didn't work out for one reason or another, but uh, finally I did get this one from uh, one of my patrons who goes by Big Steve. So uh, this one doesn't work, but I don't think it's gonna take a lot to repair. So this is gonna be partially a restoration episode, but also I have a lot of interesting trivia that I'm gonna throw in about the design philosophy of the SX64. So uh, let's get started. Uh, for example, did you know that there were potentially going to be three different models of the portable? Uh, the first one would have been the SX100, which was monochrome, had a single disk drive, and was rumored to be battery powered. Uh, however, this never made it out of the prototype stage, so none of these exist in the wild. Uh, then of course there was the SX64, which everybody knows. It has the color CRT, the single disk drive, and it's sold for $995. There was also supposed to be a DX64, which had a color CRT and a dual disk drive, but as far as I know, only prototypes of those existed, and uh, I'm not aware of any of them in the wild today, as uh, most of the ones that you see uh, posted around on the internet are actually conversions from a regular SX64. Um, I'm not sure any real DX models actually exist. The SX64 did not sell well, according to most researchers. I wondered a bit why, so I was looking at the price, and while it seems like it was expensive at $995, I thought maybe I should compare to the original price of a C64 and 1541 disk drive. And at first glance, it seems like it would be a good deal, but uh, the SX64 came to market basically two years later, and by that point, the C64 and 1541 disk drive prices had fallen quite a bit. And even if you include a monitor, since, you know, the SX64 has a built-in monitor, it's still quite a bit cheaper than an SX64. So I suspect this was part of the problem, but I'll explore some other issues later on. So here's the one I have. Uh, fortunately, the little circles haven't broken off, which is quite common. Uh, several feet are loose. At first I thought something was broken, but it turns out just a little tightening with a screwdriver is all that was needed. So let's open it up and have a look. I can tell right away I'm going to need to retrobite the spacebar. But it also appears uh, one of these clips that holds the keyboard to the main unit is busted. The other one over here seems fine. Also luckily, it comes with the keyboard cable. These are unobtainium and unfortunately quite often missing when buying an SX64. And uh, while part of the plastic is chipped off, I doubt that will have any effect on its functionality. So let's go ahead and try powering this thing up. The keyboard cable goes in here like so, and then in the uh, back of the keyboard like so. The power cord plugs in here, it's just a standard three-prong cable. And here's the power switch. Unfortunately, all I'm getting is a blank white screen, which is no surprise as that's what Big Steve told me it was doing. So I thought this would be a good chance to try out the C64 dead test cartridge. It's supposed to be able to diagnose a multitude of problems, even if the computer can't boot due to bad RAM or whatever. Unfortunately, I didn't get any results at all. So um, I guess it's time to move on to disassembly. As you can see, there are five separate boards in here, and at least three with ICs on them. And I thought I'd start by checking the 5 volt power at the user port, and I'm getting 4.96 volts, so that's just about perfect. Oddly enough, I noticed I was getting this weird pattern on the screen now. Unfortunately, it's quite apparent that it's nearly impossible to do any sort of diagnosis or repair without taking this thing apart. I simply can't see or reach anything while it's put together. And that creates a dilemma because I can't test the machine while it's in pieces either. Uh, this long board here in the back appears to be essentially the 1541 disk drive board. As you can see it says FDD which stands for floppy disk drive. I don't know if it works or not but I'm pretty sure it is not the cause of the immediate problem. Uh, this little board here is the I.O. board which has the two 6526 interface adapters on it. However, I don't think it's likely that either of these is the problem but I can't rule it out just yet. The entire back piece of the computer is essentially the power supply, uh, which I had to remove so I could reach this plug. And um, so now I can finally remove the CPU board. And this is basically the Commodore 64 part of the computer here. And it has most of the same chips. So uh, the way I'm gonna test this is I have over here a regular breadband Commodore 64 setup that's fully working. So what I'm gonna do is remove these chips one at a time and try them in the regular C64 to see what happens. Everything was working until I got to this chip here, the PLA, which uh, I actually noticed had a suspicious discolored area on it. 
And sure enough, my C64 is dead as a doornail. However, um, before assuming that is the only problem, I'm going to test the rest of the chips. And lo and behold, I discovered the SID chip was also dead. And not just dead, but so dead that it was keeping the computer from booting. So, both of these chips were bad, and uh, either one of them would have been enough to keep the machine from booting. So, for the moment, I'm just going to steal these two corresponding chips from my bread bin and put them in the SX64, as it's arguably a more rare machine. And now, in order to test that, I will need to reinstall at least the CPU board. So, let's power it on. And check it out, it works. Now, I realize there's no blinking cursor, but that's almost certainly because the I.O. board is missing, which contains the uh, system timers. So, time to put everything back together. And uh, while I have it apart, I should probably re-lubricate the drive rails. Okay, now that it is mostly put back together, time to test it out. I'll put a disk in the drive. Well, as I feared, uh, the keyboard isn't working properly. Uh, this is quite common with these units as the membrane of the keyboard degrades. A lot of these keys don't work, and even the ones that do often require several presses to get a response. On the bright side, the disk drive appears to be working, and uh, I think I'm going to go ahead and reassemble the main part of the unit now. So I had to order some parts for the keyboard, and while I was waiting, I decided to finish up a game I had been coding for the Commander X16 called Tetrads. Now this is more than just a clone of a popular brick falling game, but it's like an odyssey of sight and sound. <laughs> it has a dozen different backgrounds that change every time you clear 20 lines, and five fantastic musical compositions written specifically for this game and the Commander X16 sound system, which change every 40 lines. My goal for this was just to have some fun and to give the X16 community another fun game to play. So uh, both the game and the source code are available for free on the main uh, X16 website. Uh, you can try it out in the emulator while you wait on the uh, real thing. Okay, so let's talk about the keyboard. Uh, well, the first question is how to take it apart. I can't find any screw holes. Well, a quick internet search reveals the secret. Uh, there's a secret place on each side that you need to put pressure and it just pops apart. How about that? I think first I'm going to concentrate on this broken latch. Uh, it looks super easy to replace. I got these from Shapeways, so uh, they are 3D printed. It took about three weeks to get them. Uh, the color is a little different, but otherwise look perfect. Um, I just need to transfer the spring from the old one to the new one. And well, there we go. I think that's going to work great. In fact, um, I think I'll go ahead and replace the other one too. That way the color will at least match on both sides. Okay, let's take this keyboard mechanism out. Well, I have to say, this is a totally different design from other Commodore 8-bit keyboards. Uh, for example, uh, the shift lock is not a mechanical lock, rather it just lights up an LED. Uh, this appears to be designed by Mitsumi on November 17th of 1983. So, rather than pulling the keycaps off like usual, uh, in this case you have to pop the entire key mechanism out. Um, I found that it's easiest just to pop one side free at a time with a screwdriver. Eventually, I got pretty fast at this, so uh, it just took a few minutes to get all the keys out. And then there's this membrane. Apparently this is the failure point on all of these SX keyboards. I'm going to just peel it off. Now I'm going to clean the contacts with some alcohol. And I'll pull off this little strip, which I think is part of the old membrane. And then I'll have to clean this gunk off too. And here we go with new membrane. Um, I bought this from Sell My Retro over in the UK, which uh, also took a couple of weeks to arrive. Uh, this one comes with a plastic protective layer, which uh, may also act somewhat as a spacer to prevent uh, false key presses. I'm not sure. Anyway, now that that's on, here comes the conductive part. So now the process is to clean these disgusting keys using a wet paper towel. And uh, as each one is cleaned, I just pop a new key directly down on the board like so. Um, I will say it's a bit harder than usual to figure out where the key goes because there are so many holes, but uh, I eventually got the hang of it. And here we are, all finished. Um, these keys look beautiful now, and uh, they no longer feel gritty when I type on them. <laughs> of course, um, I'll have to wait on the spacebar as I need to retrobrite this. Uh, quite often on these old machines, the spacebar is made from a different material than the rest of the keys, and in this case, uh, it is the only one that yellowed. 
So uh, what I've done here is attached some paint can openers to the bottom for some weight to hold it down. Uh, they give these away for free at the hardware store, so I don't care if they rust or whatever. Um, now it's very cold outside today, almost freezing as a matter of fact, uh, but there's a lot of sunlight and uh, I'll need to rotate this a bit to get uh, rid of the shadow. And well, now we wait. I said that we would explore a little bit about why this machine was not very much of a success for Commodore. And um, I think one of the reasons was simply awareness. Um, the only place I ever saw one of these was a local computer store that sold used electronics. I never saw one of these in Sears or Kmart or Target or Toys R Us or any of the other places that I could find the regular Commodore 64. So that was one problem. Uh, I think a lot of people just simply didn't know it existed. Um, the other problem was I think Commodore may have been trying to market this more towards business executives or just other business use because that it was kind of the market for portable computers at the time. Uh, the trouble is uh, the Commodore 64 was never really much of a business computer. I mean, you couldn't run VisiCalc or Lotus 123 <laughs> on this platform. But even if you could, uh, there was another big problem, which was the screen. And so uh, let me show you what I'm talking about. While the SX-64 is considered the first portable computer with a color screen, that color came at a cost. If you look at the text up close, you'll see it's kind of blocky and a bit hard to read. And the reason boils down to the shadow mask. So basically any color CRT needs this piece of metal foil with holes cut in it in order to make sure that certain electrons hit certain colored patches of phosphor on the screen. Uh, the screen in the SX-64 was manufactured by JVC and what I believe they did uh, was they just took the same shadow mask material used for a larger monitor and just cut a smaller piece out of it and placed it in that 5 inch CRT. And that's why we end up with such a bad picture. So one interesting comparison I'd like to make is to connect up a 5 inch black and white television to the uh, video output on the SX64. It's the same size screen but it has no color and hence no shadow mask. So taking a look at that boot screen again, uh, let's compare with the black and white. Notice how much sharper that is? Let's try another example. Uh, while this screen here looks nice and colorful, uh, the text is definitely sharper over here. Um, now let's take a look at the sing-along screen. Uh, the text in red is almost unreadable. However, on the black and white, it looks great. In fact, this orange screen here where you set up your account is also hard to read, but it's plenty sharp on the black and white. So, my point is, if there was going to be business software on this computer, sharp text would have probably been more important than color, and so that's just something the SX-64 doesn't have. Okay, so let's check out that space bar. This is after an entire day in the sun, and it does look better, but uh, it's still yellowed on the top, so I'm going to put it back out for a second day. And well, unfortunately, we only got about two hours of sun, and then this overcast came in, it's still near freezing outside and now there's no sun, so this is about the best we're going to get from that. Um, as you can see, it doesn't quite match the rest of the keys, but uh, then I thought, you know, it wouldn't be that hard to just stick this in a Ziploc bag along with some hair developer and then uh, place it under a UV light. And so, uh, <laughs> the next morning, uh, let's go check on it. Uh, as you can see, I'm making use of this extra little workbench in the studio storage room. Anyway. After washing it off, uh, let's check. Well, it matches now. In fact, it might be just a bit too bright, but that doesn't usually last forever. So I'll call it good. I mean, it's certainly better than it was before. So I've reassembled the parts on the spacebar and uh, I'm gonna give it a bit of lubrication. Now I can reattach to the PCB and begin reassembling the keyboard. So here's another piece of trivia about the keyboard. So it's actually slightly different from a regular Commodore 64 keyboard. What they did is they basically squeezed it together like this in order to make it just a little bit more compact. Uh, the problem is this is not a natural typing environment and uh, so that makes it a little bit more difficult to type. But also, like if you look at like key combinations like uh, WASD, which granted weren't terribly common in the Commodore era, but a lot of people use that today. But you'll notice the W um, is far more off-center than it would be on a standard keyboard. Now I'm going to do a little bit of general cleaning on the system. There we go, it's all done! And um, by the way, did you know you can press shift and run stop uh, as a shortcut for loading from disk? 
On the regular C64, this function defaults to cassette, but um, they changed the kernel ROM on the SX64 since it doesn't even have a cassette port. Another kernel change, by the way, is the default screen colors. Uh, notice it's white rather than blue. This was likely done to make it easier to read on the tiny screen. You know, even though the screen isn't that great for text, it's not bad for games. Especially games that run in multicolor mode since the pixels are larger and less affected by the shadow mask issues. But uh, that's actually it for this episode, so uh, as always, thanks for watching.